song that uh, Peggy and Sharon just sang, Do You Have Room? asks a very profound question. Do we have room for our Savior? The one that makes this crazy world make sense. In order to understand that question, we have to learn about a couple of things. And we talked a little bit about that at Sunday school. I would like to just brief that up. There is a difference in this world between grace and mercy. Very often the church attempts to make grace and mercy interchangeable. And we've been taught that you say grace and mercy, but as far as my experience when I was growing up in the church from 14 years old to the young man you see before you today, it was never given to me an understanding of what the two actually are. And so I would just like to take a minute and just really briefly clarify. Mercy is what God gives us to clean up our debt, our sinful debt. When we were born into the world, we were born in sin. Meaning, we have the ability to do wrong. Nobody has to teach you how to do wrong. We just, by our flesh, naturally do wrong in our life. But God's mercy clears that up. That's what the cross was about. The cross was God's mercy. Jesus dying and taking our place when we deserve death. He took that death for us as a sinless sacrifice. But that cleared the slate. But here's the problem. Humanity is so prone to sin that he had to, in a sense, create a protection buffer. Because now that the slate was cleaned... Well, then what happens when you step out into that? You're going to step back and make a mistake again because of your flesh and sin. So what he did is he became a spiritual banker, a spiritual financer for your salvation. And he said, not only will I clear the debt of your account, your heart, but I'm even going to give you a spiritual overdraft protection. Meaning you cannot overdraft out of my mercy, my mercy stays completed. You do not fall deeper into debt. But just to keep you from doing that, I give you grace. And here's the definition of grace. The abundance of goodness that you couldn't have even hoped to deserve because none of us do. So he perfects mercy by the cross, dying on it. But grace, the overflow, the abundance that you never could have hoped to have on your own comes in the resurrection. That is why we preach the resurrection. It, uh, I was watching a, a <coughs> spiritual debate between Ben Shapiro of the Daily Wire, very wonderful, uh, political, conservative, uh, very outwardly spoken Jewish man, and he was talking to John MacArthur. And for those of you who may not know John MacArthur, he was a theologian and American pastor out in California for many years, written over hundreds of different commentaries, and even has a study Bible, the MacArthur Study Bible. Very wonderful man of God, where a lot of people turn to for clarity on the scriptures. And they were having a debate, and Ben Shapiro, being a, a, a Jew descent, Jewish descent, asked him and said, what is the difference between Christianity and Judaism. MacArthur thought for a minute, and he said, Christ. And then Ben Shapiro said, oh, well, you know, we know that Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, so there really isn't a difference. And he said, no, let me clarify. It wasn't that there is a Jesus, or that there was a Jesus. It was the fact that he resurrected from the dead. Amen. That's the difference between Christianity and Judaism. And if you study Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5, and all the way through chapter 8, you find very clearly what the Christian is as a fulfilled Jew. We are not separate. When Christianity started getting taught, it was not a separate religion. We come and descend from Israel's Judaism, which would have been Pakistani Judaism. And so what has happened is that the affiliation of Scripture has just been completed. 
And we can now rest and secure with God who has given us both mercy and grace. And speaking on that this morning, I would like to talk to you about the atmosphere of grace. We talk about mercy of God, Christ going to the cross and what He taught. But do we realize that His teaching does not operate in just the mercy? The mercy is just how we get there. His mercy is just the connection that we need to get to where we need to be. We are supposed to dwell in grace. Now, there are very many different views of how we see grace. Many people want to pre grace is uh, the ability to live on license. Meaning no matter what you do, you're covered in grace. That's not what that means. Grace, also referred to as the kindness of God... According to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it's supposed to lead a man onto repentance. Lead a man to turn away from their old desires so that because of their new life, they will have new desires. A very interesting question came up in Sunday school uh, from Brother Danny. We were talking about the difference of what happens when someone says, well, why can't I just be saved? When, I, when I'm just saved, can I not just go about doing what I want to do? And this is a very intriguing question. But here's the problem. When we meet somebody who asks this question, we need to be careful not to be overly spiritually defensive. It's not our job to debate. This is a very profound thought. We are not called to debate Christ. We're simply called to share Him. And so when somebody asks you the question, well, can't I just get saved and then just do what I want? With my life because I'm saved by grace? No, because that's grace is licensed to sin. That's not what this is. What grace does is once you have claimed grace, and once you live within that grace, the eternity of going to heaven with God the Father, then here's the problem. Your desires need to change. So yes, in essence, when you get saved, you're supposed to do what you want. However, what you want has supposed to have been transformed to match the gospel. So you are not even supposed to want the things you used to want anymore. You have a new purpose, a new vision of what life is. But Paul also writes, well, I do what I do not want to do, and I do not want to do the things that I do. Talking about how he falls into temptation here and there. That is the context of that scripture. And let me just clarify. What Paul is saying is that there will be temptations to do what was once familiar. The difference maker is the Holy Spirit living within the person sanctified by grace. And it, you will know very clearly what is right to do. And the Spirit will always compel you to do what is right. The Spirit will never compel you to do what you once did before salvation. So then the question becomes, well, if I want the things I used to want before I got saved, then what do I do? Well, then you need to realize something. If you want to continuously do the things of your old life and you claim that you have come to salvation by grace... You need to really carefully evaluate your salvation. And I'm just being flat out honest. If we do not want to, A, be in church. If we, A, don't want to minister uh, and share with people in our family or anything like that. And if we don't desire to see people to come to know Jesus Christ, then we need to evaluate salvation. I, I, I cannot teach it any other way. And I cannot pretend that that part of the Bible does not exist. Okay. I can't. That is just not why we're here. We're here. Because we are called to dismiss the old man, our old self, and die to him daily. Die to our flesh daily. So that we can experience the grace of Christ that we only have the ability to dwell in because of his mercy of being our sacrifice. This takes something that none of the church hears joyfully, but fears this term. With so much so, the church has turned it into a joke not to pray for it. And this word is patience. Patience. Because what's the old adage? You pray for patience, you'll get it. Right? Well, here's the problem. 
We need patience in order to have the atmosphere of grace. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to James chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 11. And we're going to see what James, Jesus' own brother, has to say about patience and how it relates to God's grace. Now, here's the beauty part. You're going to see the connection. At the end of verse 11, James uses God's mercifulness. Now, I don't want anyone to get confused because mercifulness, as we've already discovered today, does not mean grace. It is just the access point to grace. Amen? All right, so James chapter 5, verse 7. And it reads... Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another. Brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge, capital J, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast, You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. James lays it out. He says, in order for you to complete God's willful purpose in your life, you have to have patience. And why? Because people who do not understand the gospel, who have not claimed the gospel, who have not been cleaned and sanctified by the gospel, cannot be held to Christian standards. Meaning you cannot expect somebody who is lost not to frustrate you or cause you any kind of discomfort when you live out your faith. That's just not the way it works. If you live in perfect harmony with the gospel amongst sinners, then something isn't right. I was uh, reading a post, I think it was uh, Wanda Rowland who posted it. Can't remember who exactly posted it, but I believe it was Wanda Rowland. And uh, she posted uh, that there was a Christian and an atheist that were walking down the street and they saw the devil coming and the atheist went behind the Christian And said, hide me, he's after me, he's after me. And the Christian said, no, come out, you're fine. He's after me, he's already got you. (laughs) And this is a very true concept. If the devil is not giving you any issues, then you have to acknowledge, are you living out your faith accordingly? Because it says in Jesus' own words, For they first hated me, so they will hate you who come from me. This world that is at such disharmony cannot coexist with the harmony that comes through Christ. Because they do not work together. That is the whole point of a couple weeks ago. I held up this Bible and I told you this is the way it's supposed to work, not the way it does work. Remember I was teaching about the authority of the believer. And how this book, we are called to follow it, and we will be blessed because we follow it. However, do not make the mistake that because you try to follow this, you will not suffer tribulation. You will not be met with a friendly spirit when you use this book. You will be blessed by it. You will get farther down the road than you would have without it. But it will not be a comfortable journey, and we need to not confuse ourselves with this. That's why James calls for patience. And then he clarifies patience because I I love this, how the preachers of the day and the preachers of today can say one thing. And then the people within the congregations, the people within the following, they can hear something entirely different. All right. So what he does is he clarifies, uses a parable. It must have reigned in the family. He heard his brother speak in stories, so he speaks in stories. 
And he goes in and sees, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. So even a farmer knows that he cannot have a harvest, cannot enjoy of his labor until it has first sprung up. And so he's patient about it. A farmer knows not to go out into the field and plucking things off until the harvest time has been fully fulfilled. Correct? Because you just don't do that. You don't have what you need. But then he relates that to our faith and he says, so that is the case. Don't go out talking to the believers. Do not go out amongst the people who have just had the seed sowed in them and start trying to pluck fruit off of them immediately. Do not judge them. Do not judge them. Because here's what happens. The judge of the world, capital J, is Jesus and he's about to return to this world to claim his people. Amen. And because we have judged, and when we judge another person based off of what our preferences are, based off of what we think they're doing so wrong, Jesus will judge us as he states in Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount. He will judge us with the measure we ourselves have judged others. So for every mistake we point out in somebody else, Christ is going to relate the mistakes in our own life that have not been fixed. Amen. It is not our job to judge others. But then the question comes into play here. How do we not judge somebody, but follow the scripture that says we hold each other accountable? And i got to tell you, at first glance, these look like they contradict each other, but they don't. It's, it's a very simple concept. How do we help hold each other accountable to the faith without judging each other in the faith? It's very, very simple when we relate to the mind of Christ. We simply live out our way and we build solid relationships with each other. And when they see people in the church not behaving the way they're behaving, the questions then get asked. How come you don't do this along with me? And then that's when you have an opportunity to relate that wisdom. We get permission from each other to help and ordain each other. This, can, this does not have to be through Bible study. Cup of coffee, pure ca ca uh, conversation, realizing that we do things a little differently and hearing each other's answers and reflecting upon each other's answers. This is how we slowly, and according to the gospel, how the Lord Christ perfectionately holds us accountable to His will by the considerate sharing in the appropriate time and places, not just with our words, meaning not through Bible study, not through relating Scripture at each other, but simply just being an example of the way we act and behave. Letting that be a testimony of itself. But again, these all require patience because let's just face it, I'll be honest in my natural ability, my first instinct when I get mad at somebody, when I get frustrated at something, when I just want somebody to change, when I see they're doing something harmful, I just want to take them, shake them and say, Why? <laughs> Because I'm hot-headed. You can thank my father for that one, church. I'm hot-headed in my natural, sinful flesh. But James, at the chapter 1 and 2, he says, the anger of man will never produce the righteousness of God. Right. Now some people mean, oh, well, we can be angry at what God is angry at. No, that's not what that means either. Okay? <clears throat> that's not what that means either. Because you're incapable of feeling righteous anger because of sinful flesh. We do what the Spirit leads us to do and then we let God handle it. Matter of fact, in Matthew uh, chapter 17, he talks about how he is the one that will repay evil. Do not seek revenge, but be kind to those that hate you. And your kindness will be like the heaping of hot coals upon their head. And then he continues 
uh, James continues here in chapter 5, and he goes on, he says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, he uses the prophets here because that's what they were taught in the Jewish synagogues. He's saying, use the scriptures as your guidebook. Use the prophets in their words to reel you back in. Whenever you, do, you begin to experience these issues of being impatient with somebody, whenever you feel uh, unrighteous anger, the anger of man boiling inside of you, catch yourself quickly and excuse yourself and dismiss yourself to go to the scriptures to allow it to be like a cold bucket of ice washing over you, cooling down the flames. That should not take place. Because let me tell you something. Somebody who rubs us the wrong way most of the time has no idea that they have. We just got to be honest. People who rub us the wrong way don't always realize they have. And they're just trying to live out their life the same as you and me. The difference maker is who runs each of those person's lives. It should be the same spirit. We should be united in the same spirit of one spirit, one God, one baptism. But that's not always the case because of the human flesh. And so patience and silence is oftentimes the right tool for the Christian to extend grace to another person. To not speak bitterly toward them. But to lift them up in love even despite their own sinful flesh. We have to give each other grace because God was the one who gave us grace to begin with. And we think oftentimes our humanity says, well, they don't deserve my grace. Well, unfortunately, it's not your grace to make that judgment of. The only reason you can show grace is because God gave it to you. Your job is to take that grace He's given you in your life. And He's never turned His back on you. He's always accepted you. And you take that same grace, that same reflection of His grace, and you give it to someone else. Free of charge, without strings attached. And then he continues and he uses Job as, a, as an example of steadfastness. We need to determine what does it mean to be steadfast in patience. It means to practice it on loop. It's like listening to the same song over and over and over and over again. When you practice steadfastness in the Spirit, and you, you practice grace in steadfastness, you have to remind yourself over and over again, why do I have to be nice to this person? Why do I have to put my feelings aside? Well, first of all, we don't. We put our feelings at the feet of the Lord, who takes up our burden. And what we do is we pray for the patience to show love to this person because everybody, everybody deserves the grace of the gospel. Everybody. There is no such thing as a truly good person. We're all just not very great people that God has decided to clean and save based off of our decision upon Him. And so we have to be steadfastness Meaning to be remindful on loop that everybody has a purpose in the name of the Lord. And it's because of this purpose that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. He's compassionate because He looked at us when we were in our sinfulness, Adam and Eve, our ancestral grandparents, great-great-grandpappies. What they did, is they made a mistake and He was compassionate to them. That's the only reason He allowed them to live in His perfect creation. He could have wiped the slate clean. And man, he got close with, with the days of Noah. We know that story quite well. But he didn't. He still looked at Noah and said, okay, there's hope. There's hope here. And just so we understand that story very clearly, Noah didn't change God's mind. It was always his plan to have one person saved. But he wanted to give an example 
on a global scale as to how much he disdains sin. That's why we get the picture of Noah. And as we embark here, it's his compassion that leads to mercy. Because He loves you, because He cares about you, He gave Himself on the cross mercy. I used to watch Full House and I used to love it every time when Uncle J.C. would be, Oh, mercy! (laughs) Everyone remember that old show? It's because of mercy of a comes from a place of love. If you don't have mercy, love or compassion, you can't have mercy. Because never will there ever be a case where someone takes the payment or the toll of somebody else's punishment just because they felt like it one day. That, that, that's just never going to happen. I mean, I think we all realized this at one point or another. Uh, when I was growing up and I would get a detention, I, I always thought that, you know, someone in my class would stand up for me. No one ever did. And that's because in order to have mercy, you have to have love. And it's because of this love and mercy that we get to experience the goodness of God's grace. And that is the atmosphere of which the Christian life, the Christian faith rests in. A big thing, a big topic that's been on my mind and heart, something that I'm praying that God clarifies with me. I, I know He's got something that He wants to do with it. It's just the simple idea that because of our denominations, because of our different uh, borderlines, because of our different interpretations, I mean, the Bible alone has several, several translations, and we have groups of people that are arguing one translation or the other. And it got me to think one minute, and I just want to clarify this to the people. I just want to take a minute to just share this. Y'all have heard of Billy Graham. Right? Uh, anybody alive, breathing, and walking has heard of Billy Graham? Billy Graham was a Southern Baptist Convention pastor and preacher. He pastored West Springs uh, Baptist Church over in the Chicago area. But then he was also known for his crusades and being an evangelist. And it just it astounds me that every denomination will put their hand on the Bible, whatever translation they believe is God-ordained, and they'll claim Billy Graham was put here by God, but then we still want to claim, even though every denomination agrees that he was put here by God, we still feel the need to separate ourselves based off of humanistic interpretation differences. And it got me thinking, mankind is more interested in struggling with the concepts of God, they're struggling with uh, His ideologies, rather than simply accepting them and learning to rest in them. To which requires the most patient of hearts that we only get through our faith in Him and our growth. I implore you all the understanding of what grace is. It's the overabundance outpour that allows you and me access into heaven. Mercy, atone for your sins here on this planet alone. That's all it did. It covered your multitude of sins here. But it was grace that capped it off and said, you don't have the ability to go that far into debt again. If you accept me, you get an eternity of bliss to make up for this short time of tribulation. And this is open to all people, regardless of name on the building, regardless of creed, regardless of Bible translation. Because all that matters is Christ Jesus. Jesus Christo. Messiah, who by the love and grace of himself put him in human flesh to show us how much he truly cared. And in the words of Linus, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. 